everybody and welcome to another virtual liturgy here at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm Father Jason, the priest here, and on behalf of all of the faithful people, just want to welcome you however you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, whether you're a regular here or just checking us out. We're so grateful you're taking the time to pray with us this morning. If you have a bulletin, which you can access through the description section, either on Facebook or YouTube, I'd invite you now to, to join in our opening hymn together, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Son and Holy Spirit, and, and blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, who 
besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please pray Psalm 86 with me, found in your bulletin. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Knit my heart to you, that I may fear your name. I will thank you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and glorify your name forevermore. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the nethermost pit. The arrogance rises up against me, O God, and the band of violent men seeks my life. They have not yet seen before their eyes. But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and full of kindness and truth. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in our gradual hymn, Day by Day. Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Gracious God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing and acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I've preached before, but one of the gifts coming out of this pandemic has been the opportunity to, to watch new shows and and movies I, I normally wouldn't have the time to watch, or, or even to discover or rediscover those shows and movies that have left a lasting impression on us. One of those for me is the movie The Truman Show, which stars Jim Carrey. And in the movie, he plays a character named Truman Burbank, who doesn't realize it as for, at first, but his whole world is fake. It's been constructed for him, literally built around him by a TV producer who, who films every moment of life and then airs it for the whole world to see. And of course, as the film goes on, Truman begins to grow restless and, and, and want to find out more about this world and life, not knowing that it's, in fact, all been constructed around him. And he finds in that stirring his life beginning to be jostled into a place of ambiguity, not knowing what's real and what's not, whom he can trust and whom he can't. Thanks to a couple of caring characters in the film as well, they help jostle his life into a place of ambiguity that ultimately allows him to reach the wall, literally, of his world as he comes to the end of it and discovers a door. And when he opens the door, all that's on the other side is more ambiguity, more darkness, all sorts of uncertainty. And for a brief moment, the producer tries to entice Truman to come back to the world that's safe and predictable, even though it's fake and all been constructed for him. But that doesn't work. Truman senses this, this motion in his life to, to jostle his life even further into this place of darkness, into this ambiguity, as he steps out of the world and, and into all of that darkness and ambiguity. And, and even though there's all sorts of uncertainty, it's the only way Truman could really find life and growth. 
it's a good movie because it, it tells a story of the movement in life that we all experience. Many movies and, and novels tell that story in a way of finding ourselves kind of going along in life and then something happens that, that jostles us to a place of ambiguity, to a place where we, we don't have the clarity we once did or the certainty we once did. And while that can be scary, it can also be and often is the only way we find ourselves coming to grow. And if that's a movement in life of, of finding our, our lives brought to places of, of holy ambiguity, it would make sense that God is a part of that movement. And in the scripture readings given to us this Sunday morning, we see God about that movement jostling our lives to places of holy ambiguity. It's the movement Jesus was behind in today's gospel, as the disciples came to him wondering what they should do with the bad apples among them, those who weren't fitting in or maybe living up to the standards that they should have been living up to. And, and they were wondering what they should do with those bad apples, with those weeds growing amongst the wheat. Do they uproot them and throw them out? Jesus suggests a different wisdom to, to sit in some ambiguity for a while to allow the weeds to grow alongside the wheat because if you try to uproot the weeds you'll also uproot the wheat and destroy any possibility of growth for growth jesus jostling the lives of the disciples to to sit in some holy ambiguity and, and come to growth as a result or the prophet Isaiah in today's first reading, talk about jostling lives into a place of holy ambiguity. As this, this text comes at, at a time of exile when life as people had known it was completely dismantled. And as they sat in all of the rubble, here they hear this voice that calls them to hope. Even though life hasn't turned out as they had hoped, they're still invited to hope and trust that God is nonetheless with them as a rock and as a redeemer and to sit in the ambiguity of that hope alongside exile in fact scripture tells the story again and again of of holy growth happening through all sorts of ambiguity it's it's the story of the people of god growing in the ambiguity of of the wilderness after being led out of egypt or the ambiguity of exile through prophets like isaiah or even in Jesus's life. I mean, we don't know much about the first 30 years of his life. It's ambiguous and unclear. And yet all sorts of holy growth happened in the midst of all of that ambiguity that led Jesus into, the, into this public ministry and, and, and to, 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 to acknowledge it and proclaim a kingdom breaking into this world like, like never before. All sorts of holy growth happens in scripture when when lives are jostled into places of ambiguity and the same is true for our lives as well because we know all too well of life's ability to bring us to places of ambiguity where we're not quite sure what we're doing or or where it's all going like maybe it, that's happening in the lives of students and parents right now as they're looking into a school year beginning in the midst of a pandemic Talk about ambiguity, how that's going to look and what that's all going to entail. Everybody's trying to figure it out as we go along. Or it happens when we find out we're going to be parents, staring into the ambiguity of parenthood and, and what that all means for us. Or maybe when we find ourselves stirred to, to look in a new direction in life, either to, to maybe look for new work because we're not really fulfilled in what we're doing, or, or to look into a new chapter like retirement. And, and in truth, when, when we find our lives jostled into places of ambiguity, we often first find what Truman Burbank found in that movie. As we open the door, we find all sorts of darkness. It's, it's unclear and, and uncertain how it's going to all unfold. But thanks be to God that again and again in our lives, we find stories of others and, and even of ourselves stepping into all of that ambiguity, finding the grace and faith to do so, and, and growing as a result. It's stepping into the ambiguity of a new school year or a new school that helps us become wise and, and grow as students. 
It's stepping into the ambiguity of parenthood, not reading a book about it, that helps us become loving parents, shaping the lives of little ones. And it's, it's stepping into the ambiguity of new jobs or, or new chapters in our lives that help us discover a, a deeper sense of passion and purpose and meaning and vocation and direction in our lives. And that's what gives us the grace again and again to step into all of that ambiguity that life jostles us into from time to time. Because there we don't just find darkness and uncertainty, but we also found what Paul found and celebrated in today's second reading. The great gift of hope that allows us to enter into that all of that ambu ambiguity with a, with a holy sense of patience. A hope that, that dares us and invites us to trust and to believe that just as we are in all of our uncertainty, in all that is unclear in our lives, in all of our ambiguity, we too have all been called and claimed by Christ. And as such, our heirs, and as heirs, are able to grow through that ambiguity into a glory that awaits. Amen. We profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from the true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Again, it's always a blessing and tremendous honor to lift up the prayers you've brought to my attention throughout the week. Mehdi asks for prayers for peace and sanity. Jake asks for prayers that he can be open and honest at his upcoming doctor's appointment to get help for things he has been blowing off because of fear. Pat asks for prayers for her mother, who is dying at Angel's Grace Hospice. Melissa asks for prayers for her friends, who recently lost their daughter. Kim asks for prayers for her 97-year-old grandpa, who was hospitalized and is not doing well right now. Libby asks for prayers as she is still struggling to recover from COVID-19 after 50 days for strength, for peace, for health. Emma offers prayers of gratitude for good test results on her MRI as she navigates the difficult journey of MS. Ricardo asks for prayers that he will be able to see his parents alive again. He's here in America and they live in Spain and with the pandemic, he is uncertain when he will be able to travel there again to see them. 
Sue asks for prayers for her sister Peg, who is recovering from a broken kneecap after falling on her morning walk. Mary asks for pray prayers for her dear friend, Sister Rita, who was diagnosed with aggressive brain cancer and has decided to enter hospice care. Mike asks for prayers for himself and all who are grieving loss. He recently lost two dear friends to death and a partner because of the press pressures and separation caused by the virus. Janet asks for prayers for their dear 16-year-old friend Caleb, who is struggling with drug addiction and is currently in a residential treatment center. Arlene offers prayers of thanksgiving that her niece was found alive in Madison, but God will keep her safe from all her problems. Myron asks for prayers for his family, that they have a safe and relaxing vacation. Kelly asks for prayers for her as she's having problems with an arm she recently had surgery on last year. Amy asks for prayers for her husband, Mark, who's an emergency room physician in San Antonio, where there's a large spike in COVID cases, and for all of the staff that works in that ER and ERs across the country. Bob asks for prayers for Patty, who is recovering from a low red, red blood cell count. Lisa asks for prayers for her husband Mike's Aunt Beverly and Uncle Dave, who both have coronavirus and are away from family in Florida. Dave also has MS, which complicates the situation even more. Camille asks for friends for her prayers for her friend Stephen, who was found unconscious for health and a speedy recovery. Amy asks for prayers for herself and all who suffer from MS as this hot weather causes more flare-ups and makes daily living less enjoyable. And also for all who need encouragement and the reminder that God will see us through these uncertain times. David asks for prayers for a special intention for David and Letty. Mel asks for prayers for an end to COVID. Yvette asks for prayers for herself as she is suffering from cellulitis and also prayers as she's moving into a new apartment. Also prayers for family members of hers, Heather, uh, who is dealing with arthritis, uh, Katrina, that both Heather and Katrina may find improved health, and also for Brad, who had a mass removed from his brain and is awaiting treatment options. Cindy asks for prayers for her brother, Mike, who is recovering from a bad car accident, and prayers for her mom and dad as well. Rebecca asks for prayers for her husband, Dan, and all who have been furloughed because of COVID. Also prayers for herself as she is looking for a new job and applying to school, and prayers for her grandpa, who is turning 91. Marilyn asks for prayers for Bridget and Aaron, who are both battling cancer. Janet asks for prayers for her son, Jeff, who is trying to get out of a toxic relationship. Denise asks for prayers for Steve, who is 53 years old and being treated for brain cancer, for his family as well, that they all find strength to meet the days ahead. Cheryl asks for prayers for her son, Alex. Carlos asks for prayers for his mother, America, who is dealing with health issues, and his mother and father-in-law, Dora and Luis. And Cheryl asks for prayers for her brother-in-law, Leonard, who is being treated for an aggressive lymphoma and for his family as well. And now I invite you to take a moment and lift up whatever prayers are on your heart. Recognizing our sacred invitation to be instruments of peace in this broken world, we find the courage to pray the prayer attributed to St. Francis together. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. 
Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. We make our prayer complete by praying as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Before our final blessing, we have some wonderful opportunities to deepen our journeys of faith uh, virtually throughout the week that I'd like to call your attention to. Um, if you're joining us for prayer at 9 o'clock on Sunday, July 19th, immediately following this at 10 a.m., we have a virtual coffee hour on Zoom. And then at noon, uh, we'll be beginning a new book study. We've been, we have a, typically have a book study every first and third Sunday of the month on Zoom. But this Sunday, July 19th, we're beginning a study on the book The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James H. Cohn, who's a professor of theology at Union Theological Seminary. Um, it's a wonderful way that we're trying to engage here issues of race relations at, at St. Luke's and reflect theologically on them. Uh, that book study again begins at noon today. On Tuesday, July 21st, we have a virtual Bible study at 10 a.m. And on Wednesday, July 22nd, uh, we have morning prayer at 8 a.m. and Tuesday prayer at 7 p.m. And again, all of these gatherings are on Zoom. Uh, if you're a regular and you get our emails, you'll get those Zoom links uh, throughout the week. If you're interested in being a part of any of those discussions wherever you are, please visit our main web page, uh, www.stlukeschurch.com. And at the bottom of our main page, you can sign up for parish emails and you will get those links. And lastly, um, we're grateful for all the generosity of so many people that, that help through their financial support. Uh, love to grow here in this corner of God's vineyard. Um, if you're able and willing to make a financial do donation, there's an online link in the description boxes, either on face to Facebook or YouTube. Um, and again, we're so appreciative of, of all of the generosity we continue to receive. Prayerful generosity um, and financial generosity as well. We wish you all a peaceful and blessed week. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you all and remain with you forever. Amen.
love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.